Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sara Bonella. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this new series of the Mixed Gen seminars organized by SICA. This is a, a fully online series, which started during COVID at a moment in which it, we felt that it was particularly important to bring together the community and in particular to bring together more experienced members of our community with younger um, researchers, um, notably PhD students or young postdocs who may not have the privilege that we've all taken for granted for a long time to, you know, uh, have the opportunity to meet with people during their PhD experience because we were all uh, locked in at the time. Uh, now, luckily, we are transitioning out of the uh, extreme phase of COVID or into some kind of new normality. And so traveling is again possible, participating to conferences and workshops is again possible. But we felt also based on the feedback from the community that it would be a good idea to keep this series going because it still provides a nice informal, very informal in the SICAM style opportunity to get to know each other, for, for people to be exposed to a broad range of topics uh, and to interact informally with our speakers. So it is my pleasure to host this first session and my duty to share with you uh, a few instructions. So let me see if I can do that uh, without too much technical problems. Uh, so, okay, um, a few points before we start. You should all know that uh, this session, like all online CCAM activities, is recorded so that then you can uh, find it again on the CCAM YouTube channel or on our website. More on that in a moment. So, standard rules of webinars apply in the sense that we are going to ask all online participants to, um, to signal their questions in the Q&A tool of Zoom. Um, the, 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 the Zoom session is divided into two parts. There is a first talk by today's experienced speakers, Ike Birnan, who, uh, and this is a, a slightly longer talk. And so for those of you who feel an urgent need to ask questions during the talk, I would like to ask you to type this question in the Q&A um, chat, and I will uh, relay the question during the talk to our speaker. You will also have an opportunity to ask questions directly at the end of the talk. And this uh, happens in a slightly different way in that you should indicate to me that you want to ask a question and then we will give you the floor um, and you will receive a notification and be invited to unmute yourself so you can actually have a dialogue with the speaker. The same procedure, i.e. Uh, being invited to unmute yourself and get the opportunity to ask the question in person will apply for the second talk of today that is given by uh, one of our uh, junior colleagues. Uh, note that both the video and chat tools are disabled for participants, and so you will not be able to use either during the whole session. Now, uh, before we get to the, to the main part of, of the event today, I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, remind you or announce for you some upcoming online activities that uh, we're organizing. In particular, on December 8th, we're going to have one of our Sika Marvel classics in molecular and materials modeling. These are um, seminars in which we invite uh, originators of methods to come and share with us their techniques. Uh, we're very happy to start the year with, or to continue the year with Gabriel Kotliar and Antoine Georges on December 8th. Um, so this will start at 3 p.m. And, um, and then this will be followed by the second installment of this year's Mixed Gen. And here is going to be Stefano Baroni, who will discuss for us theory and numerical simulation of transport processes in condensed matter. So, you know, um, I, I strongly encourage you to uh, join us for, for both these events. Um, I should mention that all this material can be found on the SICAM website. And so I just wanted to steal a minute or two from our speakers just to guide you in a, in a very quick tour of the website uh, to show you how you can find the information. So this is the seacamp.org uh, website. You can look for this type of activities by going to the menu, as I just did. Oops, sorry, very bad idea. <laughs> going to the menu and then selecting other activities. And here you find uh, a, a, a menu and you can click on Seacamp Mixed Gen. Oh, 
And here you land on the page where there is the complete series of lectures that we've had and that we plan to have for next year. You can also uh, stay in touch and, and uh, receive notification of, of these activities by registering to our mailing list. This is a separate list from the one uh, that we use for general CCAM announcements because we don't want to flood your uh, mailboxes unless you're really interested to spend some time in spending time with us. But if you're not registered to, to, to the mailing list for these announcements, please do that uh, if you want to. Okay, that's really all I have to say for today. And so it is now my pleasure to give the floor to Silke, who will uh, launch our new season of the Mixed Gen with a talk on correlated transition metals, new twists to old problems. Silke, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sara, and uh, thank you, SICAM, for this really beautiful initiative. Um, so let me share screen. Now you should see a boring screen and now a screen which is somewhat more interesting. Is it correct? Can you see Perfect. me? Can you hear me? That's very good. Yes. Good. Then thank you very much for joining today and uh, for being interested in correlated oxides. And indeed, I will mainly focus or I will focus on correlated vanadium oxides, a new twist to old problems. So this will not be a technical uh, talk, but a kind of materials and application of some uh, recent correlated theories to materials uh, presentation. I will focus, as I said, on vanadium oxides, which I feel are a particularly interesting example of materials displaying metal insulator transitions. So here on the left hand side, you have a historical picture from Moir 1959, uh, where you see the connectivity as a function of inverse temperature for a series of vanadium or titanium transition metal oxides. Uh, so you have here the monoxide, vanadium sesquioxide, and here, one of my favorites, vanadium dioxide, undergoing a transition from a high temperature, high conductivity phase to a low temperature, low conductivity phase. And look at the scale here, which is logarithmic. So you are actually witnessing a drop of resistivity of several orders of magnitude when you heat up the material. And that is not a singular case, but it's actually quite uh, characteristic here. You can also see my, my mouse, right? You can see my cursor. When you move it, yes. Okay, good. Um, so I will focus a lot on vanadium dioxide in the uh, later part, but I also mentioned the sesquioxide for which you see on the right hand side the phase diagram here. So this is a time honored uh, phase diagram as a function of uh, either tiny amounts of doping or pressure. And there is a discussion about the function of doping being in the first place a chemical pressure and not a doping in, the in terms of charge carriers. Um, then as a function of doping or pressure and temperature, you can generate a phase diagram where you have actually uh, at high temperatures, a paramagnetic insulator metal transition and at low temperatures, you go to an antiferromagnetic insulating phase. So all these materials are actually just particularly interesting examples of what nowadays we like to fancily call quantum materials. Actually, materials where electronic Coulomb correlations are important and can lead to emergent properties. So emergent properties, really, I would like to connect back historically to the time on that uh, article by uh, P.W. Anderson in 1972, who described in a nearly philosophical work here, the uh, way properties can emerge from the many body problem, from interactions between elements, between particles, entities in an interacting many particle system. And so just let me just cite uh, this sentence here, the behavior of large and of large and complex aggregates of elementary particles is not to be understood in terms of a simple extrapolation of the properties of a few particles. And that is both really the essence of the problem that we have. How are we going to describe these emergent properties, 
metal insulator transition as a function of some parameter, you do a tiny little change to the material and you change drastically its properties. But of course, it's also a chance because it means that you can, in principle, change materials properties if you control the parameters that uh, play on it. So as a function of composition, of pressure, of temperature, you can actually vary the properties in principle in a controlled way. And so what I will do in the talk today is I will first uh, give you an introduction into what I believe we understand nowadays uh, and that is uh, really uh, work that em has emerged over the last uh, decades um, about the metal insulator transition or the metallic in the insulating phases in the, let's say, plain vanilla uh, VO2, so just the uh, vanadium dioxide that I've just shown you. And then I will show the new twists to old problems. Um, I will comment on, or I will show more, more recent work uh, uh, on hydrogen doped vanadium dioxide with a kind of re-entrant metal insulator transition. Uh, then I will switch on to the so-called B phase of vanadium dioxide, which is also believed to be a metal insulator transition material, but I will uh, hopefully convince you that uh, things can be more interesting. And eventually, if I still have time, I uh, would like to show you recent uh, developments, mainly actually on the experimental side, uh, connecting back to early theories of vanadium sesquioxide. Okay, but let's start with the metal insulator transition in vanadium dioxide. So just another way of plotting the same thing that you have already seen. Here is resistivity as a function of temperature. And you see actually the metal insulator transition, which is a first order transition, which is a hysteresis curve here, at temperatures slightly above room temperature. And it is accompanied by a structural transition from a monoclinic low temperature phase to a metallic uh, rutile phase. The fact that the temperature is slightly above room temperature is actually a very interesting feature of, the, of this material and makes it a candidate for uh, quite a lot of uh, applications. So there is nearly uh, nothing that you cannot find uh, as being proposed uh, for uh, vanadium dioxide as an application, ranging from uh, switches, memories, photodetectors, uh, until um, oscillator systems for memory stars, uh, smart window coatings, uh, camouflage systems, or whatever you name it. And the idea, of course, is always in some sense that you use these changes of the properties as a function of some control parameter. Okay, let me switch to the uh, basic electronic structure. So this is uh, from a very, very nice uh, review article uh, of Volker Eyot, uh, early 2000s. It's a density functional theory calculation. And what is plotted here is the uh, Concham band structure. Um, with the Fermi level at zero of the rutile phase. So that is a calculation for the crystal structure uh, of the phase that is uh, the one that is realized at high temperature, which is the metallic phase. And what you uh, can distinguish here in the first place is that you have a manifold of vanadium D states here, corresponding to the D1 configuration of vanadium. And more precisely, even you can divide the uh, D-manifold by crystal field splittings into a T2G manifold and an EG manifold. And we have one electron in the T2G states that are down here. Then at lower energies, you have the oxygen states. And actually, this is a thing that I won't care so much in the first place because the Fermi loving being here, one electron in the D states, uh, it is clear that we have to focus our attention on this part here. But first, let us look at the corresponding picture for the monoclinic phase. So we take now the other crystal structure, and again from Volker Eyat, same uh, setup, same calculational uh, framework. Um, and again, you have here. Now the T2G states, Fermi level is at zero, and you see that there's one band which is uh, close to being split off, but not completely. So the Concham band structure here would look metallic, but it is obvious that it's not very, very far from an insulating configuration. 
Vanadium dioxide has, has been considered quite early on, and this is a, a paper by Silberstein and Mott, as one of the materials, which is a prototype for a material where yet another effect than uh, electron delocalization in uh, band structure picture uh, could be important. Namely, this uh, was the famous Mott effect, a Mott insulating behavior, where electrons could uh, display insulating behavior because of strong Coulomb interaction effects. So vanadium dioxide was early on proposed in this category. In 1994, there came uh, strong counter arguments against that by uh, collaboration by Venskovich, Schulz and Allen, uh, who did DFT calculations and in particular focusing on structural properties, found out that the structural properties were not so badly described in density functional theory, and also with the argument that one might just need a little bit to split off the lowest band, one might even have a concham band structure that could become uh, insulating uh, uh, at the DFT level. Okay, what are we talking about? Uh, structural effects uh, um, more band-like than correlated? Well, the underlying question in this debate is the following. I have told you that the structural, that, that the metal insulator transition is accompanied by a structural transition from this low, from this high temperature rutile phase to a low temperature monoclinic phase. And as you can see here on this plot, this is actually uh, going along because you double the unit cell in the C direction here. So you have now twice the, the length here, roughly. And you do that because vanadium atoms along the C axis here pair up. They move a bit closer together pairwise and tilt slightly out of the C axis. And that means that you actually have a dimerized chain like structure along the C axis. Doubling of the unit cell means actually backfolding of the, the bands means you can be close to a piles transition. So doubling the units in one direction is the classical scenario in which you then also could have a natural language for explaining the insulating behavior. And this was actually resonating with uh, ideas by John Goodenough as early as uh, 71, who uh, qualitatively gave a picture of the rutile to monoclinic transition as is sketched here. Um, what is called D parallel and pi star in this picture is actually within the T2G manifold, the orbital that is responsible for hopping along the C axis, this is the D parallel, and the remaining two EG pi orbitals, which are slightly higher in energy. And then his proposal was that the uh, dimerization leads to a bonding anti-bonding splitting of the D parallel bonding and anti-bonding combinations, and a little push up of the EG pi or pi star bands here, which then would open up again. So just to clarify, so what we are talking about is this specific orbital here, which is the D parallel or A1G that would then uh, essentially do the job. Okay, strong counter arguments against the idea that uh, everything might just be a pi transition came from the experimental side, from uh, Morris Rice, and uh, here the first author is Jean-Paul Pouget, I think it was his uh, thesis work. And what they did was to do little variations of VO2 by either slight chromium doping or tiny or, or uniaxial pressure and under these conditions, they could stabilize further phases of the material. And in particular, they could stabilize phases where you would have two inequivalent chains in the unit cell, of which one would only be dimerized, but not tilted, and the other one would be tilted, but not moving closer together. And then you could again do the piles argument on the chain structure where you have shorter and longer bonds. But the other chain where 
vanadiums were still equidistant to each other, could be shown to be actually of mod type in the sense that it had a magnetic response of a Heisenberg chain. And that was interpreted as a signal of uh, electron localization, which for sure was not just a pi transition. So the, the fact that the whole phase was now insulating could be attributed to a mod phenomenon. And their argument was that this phase or these phases are actually continuously connected to the initial phase without doping or without uh, uniaxial pressure. Um, just for the uh, nomenclature, let me uh, mention, so the monoclinic, the usual monoclinic phase, we will refer to as the M1 phase, and the additional phases that were artificially introduced here are then the uh, phases called here M2 or tetragonal T. And uh, so this was actually uh, what I just said. So you have the phase diagram with the metal insulator transition here, slightly above room temperature, low temperature M1 phase, high temperature R phase. And when you here, for example, chromium dope the system, you go to the tetragonal phase, the M2 phase, which are mod insulators and which clearly emerge from the M1 phase. The modern version of the phase diagram is this one. And this shows you actually that there's plenty of more ways to play on the properties of this uh, material, either by substitutions, by uh, oxygen deficiencies, and also by uh, uniaxial stress or uh, strains by uh, particular growth conditions. And I think that in the second talk today, Peter will show us yet another way of actually influencing the properties uh, by germanium substitution, if I understand it correctly. Okay, but let me switch back now to the uh, theory. So I have shown you the conchamban structure um, before, and on the left side here is just the density of states corresponding to those uh, band structures. So the dashed blue and uh, red lines here are just DFT, LDA uh, densities of states corresponding to the bands that I have shown you before. And what you see, it's the T2G manifold here, where, if anything, the band width is slightly smaller in the rutile phase, which is the metallic one, than in the insulating one. And that already tells you also that it's uh, probably not just a uh, plain vanilla uh, Hubbard model-like uh, metal insulator transition in terms of bandwidths and Coulomb directions. So there's something more interesting going on. What we did, and that is actually uh, quite old calculations in collaboration uh, calculations with uh, sorry, quite old calculations in collaboration with Sasha Potayayev, Sasha Lichtenstein, and Antoine George, um, were dynamical mean field calculations. And I will tell you in a second what that uh, means. I will first show you the results and discuss what we see from that. Um, here for the sorry, in red for the metallic phase, and in blue for the insulating phase. And so what I mean by this is really we did the DMFT calculation for the given crystal structure of, on the one hand, the rutile structure, and on the other hand, the monoclinic crystal structure. And that is, again, in comparison to the concham density of states in the background. So what you see is that in the metallic phase, you have a slight narrowing of the bands, and you start to form a satellite feature here at lower energies. And that's it essentially for the occupied part of the spectrum. So again, the Fermi level is at zero. In the insulating phase, you indeed open up the gap. So we are really looking now at the spectral function uh, that we expect for the material. We open up a gap and we have a relatively well-defined peak here, um, which is though closer to the Fermi level and the satellite feature uh, of the metallic phase. Okay, this was then taken by the group of Hao Cheng at that time in Cologne and compared to experimental photoemission spectra. So this is experiment and this is theory after actually applying Fermi function. And uh, so here you have the comparison, the rutile phase with a relatively, uh, uh, with a peak at the Fermi level uh, and a slight satellite feature that you might compare to these uh, features here. And then the insulating phase where you have the gap opening at the Fermi level, uh, which compares to what you see also here in the calculation. 
Okay, so at this stage, I should probably tell you a bit more of uh, how this was actually done. And for that, let's think one second. So what happens in the life of an atom? So here is my crystal. I map or I look microscopically on the crystal structure. So it's vanadium atoms here surrounded by the oxygen octahedra. And this vanadium is in a D1 configuration. But D1 configuration in a relatively narrow shell. So the quantum fluctuations that you might have, uh, I like to think of them like a little movie where you really picture them as fluctuations. You can have electrons hopping to the side. If there was already a first electron, you will have a Coulomb interaction. Then the electron can go away. And so you have fluctuations uh, really of the occupation on the site and interactions whenever you have several electrons. So in the multi-orbital system, several are possible um, uh, at the same time. So now, and, and uh, this is actually what uh, dynamical mean field theory is uh, doing for you. It is essentially putting the mathematics behind this intuitive picture of including locally quantum fluctuations and the corresponding interactions and the possibility of going back somehow to the surroundings as pictured by above. So in mathematical terms, more technically speaking, it means that you do a many body calculation where you approximate the in principle dynamical orbital and momentum dependent many body self energy by momentum independent self energy, which however keeps orbital dependence and its dynamical character, which is calculated from a self consistently determined effective local quantum impurity problem. So you picture the solid as an atom coupled to an effective path which allows electrons to, which, which allows the site to have uh, fluctuations between configurations by electrons uh, going back and forth between the atomic site and the bath. So I will not uh, say much more on the MFT. I think you have actually had a whole uh, session already in the in the CCAM series very nicely. I will just comment on one further uh, point which is specific to the work uh, I'm showing you here, namely, um, I have talked before about a vanadium dimerization, and now I'm speaking of the happenings on a single atomic site. And that is clearly inconsistent. So what we actually have to do and what we did is rather indeed think of a pair of vanadium sites. So what is actually taking the effective atom role of usual DMFT here is an effective dimer problem. So we think what can happen on a pair of vanadium atoms and let that fluctuate in time. And that means that actually we are doing the simplest version of cluster DMFT, where the cluster is just a two side cluster of two neighboring vanadium atoms. So that means self energy replaced by self energy that keeps dynamic character, that keeps orbital character, but where the k-dependence is dropped apart from the fact that you have within the dimer now a local and an inter-site component. And that means that you can also go, for example, to the bonding or anti-bonding uh, dimer state. Okay, so this was how this uh, calculation was produced. Um, and uh, we can actually do better than just looking at the overall total spectral function as we did here. Namely, we can also analyze this quantity in a k-resolved fashion. And so this is a color plot now for the intensity as a function of energy and k-vector of that thing. Let me make a little discretion. So again, what we are doing here is photo emission. So or we compare to photo emission. So what you should have in mind is an experiment where you have a photon kick out an electron by photoelectric effect from your sample and you measure the energy and the angle of the um, of the outgoing electron and you draw a histogram of the intensity of these electrons and uh, so here is a schematic uh, view where this has been done both for the electron removal spectrum measured in photo emission and for the hypothetical in this case uh, electron addition spectrum that you would measure in the inverse photoemission process. And altogether, this histogram uh, plot 
with a caveat of that I neglect matrix elements effects here, I will call the spectral function. So what we are looking at is strictly speaking, not the density of states anymore as before, but really the uh, spectral function corresponding to this process, again, modulo the neglect of matrix elements effects, which can be related in the Green's function language to the imaginary part of the single particle Green's function of this system. Okay, so this is really the K resolved spectral function in that sense. So you should think of it like photo emission and inverse photo emission uh, spectra. On the left hand side, you see the K resolved spectrum of the insulating phase. On the right hand side, of the uh, metallic phase, of the brutal phase. And um, the first striking feature is certainly that in the rutile phase, in the metallic phase, you have much less well-defined features and uh, very rapidly, as soon as you are here, uh, relatively small energies from the Fermi level, you have actually quite broad features um, which indicate that lifetime effects are really important here. And uh, that means that many body correlations actually uh, report corrections to the band picture in this metallic phase. In the insulating phase, at first sight surprisingly, but if you think about it a bit further, actually not so surprisingly, things are much better defined. So here the maxima of the spectral function follows something which can to a very good approximation actually described by a band picture. And uh, actually the, the first trivial observation should have been you open up a gap at the Fermi level. That means you have now indeed the spectral function correspond to, corresponding to an insulating state. You can further analyze how this comes about. In fact, the states down here do indeed correspond as postulated by good enough to a bonding A1G orbital character. And that means that we actually can analyze indeed this spectral function in terms of here bonding A1G, anti-bonding A1G, which uh, shows up here, and the stuff in the middle is actually the EG pi states. Um, okay, if you say that, if you have bonding, uh, a bonding band split off here, in a D1 configuration, you can easily uh, uh, think of it in the following way. Each vanadium, each of the two vanadiums in the pair, gives one electron. They sit together in the bonding state, and that means you necessarily are actually in a singlet state. Uh, that means you have a spin zero here which is indeed what is seen in experiment. So that is the magnetic susceptibility, again, uh, from uh, Pouget et al, where at low temperatures, that means in the temperature range of the monoclinic phase in the pure compound here, you indeed have a dead flat susceptibility corresponding to the absence of magnetic response because of the uh, singlet formation. So that is consistent with this view. Okay, so now let's get back to good enough because as you saw, okay, this was actually very close to uh, what I've shown you before. And uh, you have the bonding antibonding splitting, you have the EG pi states. But of course, you can ask the question so, what is now indeed the bonding antibonding splitting? And for this, we made a little model in the dynamical mean field uh, treatment. Quite naturally, uh, uh, it drops out that what you should investigate is actually this two-site uh, problem, which you can, in zeros approximation, if you forget about the bars, consider as a hubbard daimler problem just for the A1G state now. And this thing is exactly solvable. It's actually a very simple uh, exercise where you have, um, as a function of T over U, coefficients alpha here, which determine how far or how close the ground state of this Hubbard dimer is to what we would like to call the punt mulliken state, that means just the slater determinant uh, in a non-interacting uh, system, or to the heitler london state where you would have projected out double occupancies. So here you have two electrons on one vanadium and nothing on the other, or the inverse, and that state 
is of course uh, possible uh, if you are um, in a hund uh, picture, but it is projected out when you go to the strong coupling limit in the heitland onland sense. And uh, we have the ground state, we have the ground state energy, and we can calculate the bonding, anti-bonding splitting. And there is something interesting, namely this is square root of u squared plus uh, 16 t squared, t is the hopping, u is the uh, Coulomb interaction. If we take the parameters that represent indeed the, van the A1g vanadium dimer in the solid, we find that uh, T is of the order of a fraction of an electron volt, where U is several electron volt, meaning that actually this energy scale is largely dominated by U. So you do have a bonding antibonding splitting, but the energy scale of the splitting is essentially set by the Coulomb interactions. And so this was the reason why we dubbed then this uh, mechanism a correlation enhanced by else mechanism, because really the energy scales are not the ones of uh, pure child's transition where you would expect the T. Okay, uh, just uh, one uh, short remark on comparison to optics. So this is now uh, optical connectivity calculated from the previous calculation by neglecting vertex corrections. So we exclude excitons here. And uh, this is done for the metallic phase on the left-hand side, the insulating phase on the right-hand side. Um, the red curves are theory. And here the different red curves are for different uh, polarizations. In the metallic rutile phase, you see that the different polarizations do not make a big difference. Uh, in the uh, insulating phase, this changes a bit. Um, you have a clear draw to peak here at low energies, which is in uh, agreement with the experimental results. So all the green and blue curves are experiments. And one can remark that the experimental curves uh, are diverging a bit among each other, in particular here in the range of the onset of oxygen transitions which is uh, probably uh, to be linked to different uh, growth conditions, different measurements conditions, and so on. But in the light of this, the agreement between experiment and theory is uh, reasonably good, I would say. If then you go to the insulating phase, you open up the gap here, and you have a little onset where you have optical transitions within the T2G manifolds, and then you really shoot up when, you, when the oxygens come in. And again, here, the theoretical curves in red and the experimental curves in blue and green are in reasonably good agreement. Okay, let me make a few uh, general remarks before moving on to the uh, next uh, step. So I made this remark of the M1 phase actually relatively well described by a band structure. And the blue curves that I had in the previous plot were actually uh, curves calculated by extracting from the DMFT calculation uh, an effective potential, which is, however, strongly orbital dependent, and that means non-local in the electronic structure sense, and which then reproduces very nicely the uh, peak structure of the spectral function. Um, one can then check if this effective band structure is also uh, possible, uh, if it's also possible to, to obtain from other um, uh, methods. So there's a few very interesting GW works. I can comment more on this if there is interest. LDA plus U has some uh, problems. And I think overall you should really think of this M1 phase as a dimer phase in the sense of the Hubbard dimer. In the rutile phase, the spectral function has much more uh, deviations from just the pure bench picture, uh, signaling relatively strong incoherence. And also, already pointing out a theme that will become later on important again, a relatively strong temperature dependence actually of the overall property. And then there has been a sip, -sip in work. I would in particular like to mention the work of Brito here, uh, which tried to attack the M2 phase where you have uh, two chains. And of course, then things get calculationally more. Okay, so this was the background on what I think we uh, can nowadays say on basic, uh, the basic electronic structure of VO2. So now let me switch to the more uh, recent twist. And so the first one is hydrogen 
a hydrogen doped version of uh, vanadium dioxide. Indeed, you can uh, insert hydrogen in the uh, um, pristine VO2 compound, which is here, and you can do so. So this is really phase diagram as a function of the hydrogen composition in HX VO2. So going all the way until one H per vanadium. So here you have H VO2 and as a function of temperature. If you do so, you see that the initial metal insulator transition, so here insulating M1 phase, uh, metallic rutile phase, is actually somehow destroyed. The uh, material gets metallic at dopings as low as 3%. It continues all the way here in a relatively bad metallic regime. And then at X equal one, when you have one hydrogen per vanadium, you get back to an insulating state. If you start from the metallic rutile phase here, you dope and you get a worse metal and eventually again you get insulated. So this has been uh, investigated experimentally and so here I'm referring actually to the collaboration with the Korean group of uh, No and uh, So Yun Kim and uh, for the theory part uh, Si Yang Park and uh, Stefan Backes. Um, so what they did uh, in the experiment was to measure, for example, optical connectivity once in the low temperature regime, when you start from the insulating phase here. So this is the black curve, pristine M1 phase. And when you dope it, as I said, 3% is already enough to induce some metallic states here. You continue, you continue, so you, we are going here. And then at 100%, you actually reopen up the gap. If I start here, that is the high temperature measurements down here, you start from the metallic compound, you make it worse metallic, worse metallic, and eventually you're in the insulating phase. Okay, on the way, you are actually crossing what is labeled as orthorhombic one and orthorhombic two phase. So the structures are given here. Um, in the intermediate range, uh, we don't uh, care about the hydrogen. Um, in the fully uh, um, hydrogenated uh, material, the belief is that you have an ordered structure where the hydrogens actually uh, relate uh, in these uh, spaces close to the oxygens. And if you do uh, DFT calculation, you can analyze what they do. They actually mostly talk to the oxygens. Here's a little bit of hybridization in, in that area here. And otherwise, they will in particular just give electrons. So we can think of this HX VO2, two zeros approximation as a VO2 where we have actually added X electrons. And that means that we continuously go from a D1 configuration to a D2 configuration. Apart from that, the overall basic electronic structure is similar to what we had seen before. So we have an oxygen, it's in a manifold here, and the T2G states that we have already studied in the pristine compound, but which here now are filled with two electrons. Okay, so two electrons, that is not insulating in the previous picture. Nevertheless, when we do the cluster DMFT calculation here, we indeed find within the T2G manifold here in blue, opening of a gap, and here as expected oxygens and AG pi states. So the thing comes out as an insulating uh, um, compound if you look at the theoretical spectral function. And now we have to analyze why is that the case? So how can we have an uh, insulating D2 configuration here? And uh, that is very interesting, we analyze the different orbital contributions now within the T2G manifold. Within the T2G manifold, we have the A1G orbital, the one which is along the chain, and the two remaining ones. And we plot separately the spectral functions corresponding to these three orbitals. The A1G has again, actually, the bonding antibonding splitting as before. So that is, I would say, nothing new correlation enhanced piles mechanism to get the states away from the Fermi level. However, the EG pi orbitals here do something more interesting. You see it here. 
So the xz orbital is essentially empty, which means that the remaining electron goes into the yz orbital, which is then half filled. And that means that here we are actually doing a mod transition. So one orbital is correlation enhanced by else, one is empty, and one is mod, mod insulating. And that after orbital ordering because of this uh, effect here. So you can say you have it uh, all in one, uh, both a piles or correlation enhanced piles transition and a mod transition depending on the orbital. You can summarize that by saying that, okay, if I compare the usual M1 phase now to the doped version where you get metallic, so you fill a bit the A1G and the G pi states, and then you go to the D2 configuration in the fully hydrogenated case, you do have the bonding, anti-bonding splitting, the empty XZ orbital, and the YZ actually split into lower and higher and upper Hubbard bands in the mod sense. Okay, let me move on to the uh, vanadium uh, dioxide B phase because I think I'm, uh, yes, I'm approaching the end, but I still have a few minutes. Um, so the vanadium, uh, so vanadium dioxide can be grown on appropriate substrates. And uh, this has been done by the solid state chemistry group. So here's a paper uh, from the Indian uh, group uh, from Bangalore and uh, connections. Um, where it was grown on a strontium titanate uh, substrate. And depending on the orientation, you can actually induce different phases. Different phases, one, which is the so-called A phase, which is just insulating. And one, here in blue, the B phase, which is also seemingly undergoing a metal insulator, well, insulator to metal transition with a drop of resistivity, again, by several orders of magnitude, and under similar conditions, actually even worse or even better than the usual M1 to rutile, monoclinic to rutile transition. So the black curve is the previous rutile to monoclinic uh, transition, while what I label B phase here is both the High resistance, resist, high resistivity, and low resistivity state, and uh, we will refer to them in the following as high T, HT, and low T, LT, uh, B phases. Okay, so if we compare the photoemission spectra of the high T and low T B phase to the previous rutile and M1, then we get actually quite similar picture. So here you have the low temperature B phase with a gap at the Fermi level, and in the IT phase you have some weight, spectral weight, which looks relatively similar to the scenario that you have in the rutile to monoclinic transition. So this is just a different photoemission experiment from what I showed you before, um, because this was supposed to be under similar conditions here. Um, nevertheless, when you divide by Fermi function, you have a little indication for a first difference because if you do so for the usual uh, monoclinic and rutile phase, you have here a peak at the Fermi level and here in the high temperature B phase, things are a little bit less picky and you rather have a little depletion. Nevertheless, you do have clearly spectral weight here in a pronounced fashion at the Fermi level. Okay, so what we did now beyond the comparison as a, at a given temperature, of the spectral function, again calculated from DFT plus DMFT or cluster DMFT, was to make a, a systematic study as a function of temperature. And of course, in theory, we can do things that experimentalists can't do. Namely, we can take the structure that is stable at a given temperature, and then we can investigate its electronic structure and spectral properties at any temperature we want. And so that's what we did. So we take the high temperature crystal structure here in violet and the low temperature crystal structure in green. And we do calculations at high temperature, intermediate temperature, low temperature. So at high temperature indeed, you have here in the low temperature structure, this kind of dip, and a nice spectral weight at the Fermi level. But when you cool down, there's actually a little surprise, namely both of these structures eventually display a gap. 
So that means that the high temperature phase, which seemingly is a metallic phase in the metal insulator transition scenario, is indeed emerging from an underlying hypothetical zero temperature uh, structure, which is an insulating material. And that is actually the what I announced before a bit, uh, what I alluded to before, uh, extreme sensitivity of the electronic properties to temperature, which is carried here by the monibody self-energy. So we are actually uh, kind of uh, hypothesizing or advancing that both high temperature and low temperature B phases are in principle uh, insulators if you were looking, if you were able to look at both of them in their low temperature regime. So now this is of course intriguing. So what is really happening in terms of temperature dependence and what is uh, causing these changes? So to analyze that, we try to understand in how far the Daimler picture with Hydra London and uh, um, uh, completely local picture are actually uh, surviving. And for this, we defined a quantity here, this delta HL, which depends on correlators that measure correlations between the occupation on vanadium one with spin up, vanadium two with spin down. So it's kind of dimer correlator in a normalized fashion in such a way that this quantity would be one in the pure Heitler London limit where you suppress the double occupancy and it would be one half in the single site limit where both vanadiums lived independently their lives. And then we plot this thing as a function of the total occupation of the Daimar A1G orbital and as a function of temperature. And we situate the results of the uh, M1 phase, so the usual monoclinic phase, and the low temperature and high temperature phases in this little uh, phase diagram. And indeed, you see that uh, for the M1 phase, your occupation is close to two, so close to the filled bonding state with a spin singlet uh, up, down, uh, minus down, up, and uh, the two electrons are uh, satisfied there, and nothing much happens as a function of temperature. But in the B phase, and this is two zeros, order approximation true for both phases here, you have a, a considerable reduction of the overall charge in the A1G orbital, induced actually by the mixing with other states, because the crystal structures are a bit more uh, complicated, less symmetric, there's more hybridization and more mixing. So you have overall less state in the A1G orbital. And then in this timer scenario, this gives you a relatively strong temperature dependence on the one hand of the charge itself, and then also of the dimer uh, like of, of the Heidler London like uh, Daimler behavior. So we believe that this is actually key to these very much, very strongly temperature dependent properties, which can lead to something that looks like a metal insulator transition while actually not truly being one. Okay, I think I'm now over time and quite exactly over time. So I will just see. Yeah? Take a few more minutes. I can take a few moments. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, okay, then I will uh, just uh, very briefly uh, show you this last example. And as I said, so this is essentially a recent experimental development uh, that came on V203. So the French here at the Synchrotron Soleil were titling V203, the movie, an old mystery finally put into images. And so what was the background? So it was um, now on vanadium uh, sesquioxide here. So we are talking about the second example. Um, for which, okay, let me abbreviate this a bit. Let me go here. Um, early calculations were postulating that the metal insulator transition could be viewed as essentially driven by the occupation of the A1G orbital. So here in this scenario, the uh, compound is in a, a D2. And the question is, if the A1G is empty, the EG pi is half filled, it can be insulating. If the A1G goes down, the 
thing is metallized, and this was actually what uh, was responsible for the metal insulator transition in the calculation. So here you have it in pictures. You have here an A1G band just poking over the Fermi level, and then you have EG pi states making up all the spectral weight down here and uh, being close to half filled. So now, the beautiful thing that came about was that in the group of Andres Santanda Ciro and Patrice Lefebvre from Synchrotron Soleil and Ismo in Orsay, they could measure with angle resolved photo emission as a function of temperature. That means really going through how the states evolve when you cool down and when you heat up again. Okay, why do you cool down and heat up again? Because, well, as I said, as I've mentioned before, it's a uh, first order transition with a strong hysteresis. So that means on cooling or heating, you have uh, somehow uh, delay. So you start here at 180 Kelvin in the metallic phase with a nice A1G orbital, which is, which is um, uh, continuously losing weight when you cool down here. Now you're losing it, you're losing it here. Okay, something still here. And you're in the insulator. At the same time, you pile up spectral weight here at this uh, lower energies, which do form just the Hubbard band in the insulating state. And when you go back, you do the inverse process, but a little bit shifted. So here you have more than you would have here. So this is indeed uh, corresponding to the picture that in the metallic phase, you have the A1G band, which is carrying a little bit of charge, which is missing to half filling in the, H in the EG pi band. And eventually, in the insulator, you go to uh, a, a half-filled EG pi and an empty A1G orbital occupation. OK, and that was then uh, here, this imaging, the itinerant to localized transition of the electrons in B2 as well. OK, let me summarize. So I have shown you that even though these are really old problems, so VO2, V203, I've shown you the early papers uh, date uh, from uh, more than 50 years ago, you can still find new twists and interesting physics and new variations actually uh, on the basis of uh, old physical elements. So I've first shown you the classical, let's say, uh, metal insulator transition in VO2, which I believe uh, we do understand now quite well on this uh, basis of the correlation enhancement of the piles uh, transition. And then I have shown you the new surprise in the VO2B phase, uh, where people believed that it was a metal insulator transition, but where we advocate that one should rather think of it like an insulator insulator transition with this little uh, twist that the uh, overall electronic structure is very, very strongly temperature dependent. I have shown you the hydrogenated VO2 where you have the all-in-one inclusive uh, correlation enhanced piles transition in one orbital and a mod transition in the other. And finally, the VO2, the, well, sorry, the VO2 or three, the movie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Susie. Very, very, very nice. nice introduction. introduction. Well, it's right. Right. Um, uh, I would like, I would like to invite, 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 to, invite to ask questions. questions. And we can do that by um, uh, signaling that in the QA tool of Zoom. Um, maybe while we wait, we will invite you to unmute your microphone and then we will be able to ask directly. Maybe while we wait while we for wait. participants to gather the courage to ask questions, I can start from a very general one, Silke, because this is fascinating physics, and I was wondering if you could perhaps highlight for us the you know the key computational challenges. Of course, I guess they require very accurate electronic structure calculations, and so what are the you know the challenges and the main tricks of the trade? Yes, yes. Okay, so I have not at all really commented on the on the technical parts here. Um, because I think you had uh, this uh, session which was largely focused on dynamic mean field theory. So everything that was said there remains still valid. Um, so the key uh, elements in any, uh, let's say, 
electronic structure calculation using DMFT is, of course, to have these two uh, parts, to have, on the one hand, the realistic setup by the electronic structure calculation, and then to solve, essentially, the, the dynamic mean field theory equations in a somewhat uh, self-consistent way. So here, we are, um, um, uh, many of the calculations I've shown you, in particular, the, the old ones were not the ones where we pushed very hard on the technical part. Um, but uh, the, uh, let's say, the, the interesting, the most interesting thing certainly is here this uh, question of non-local correlations, because as I briefly alluded to, uh, the picture which is really needed here is one beyond usual DMFT in the sense that you need to take into account intersite vanadium, vanadium correlations, and they really play the role. So that means you need uh, to uh, have a, a dimer problem. It's a multi-orbital problem. And then uh, what we can do nowadays, what we were not really able to do uh, 10, 15 years ago, is to study this systematically as a function of temperature, which is key here. So we do solve the DMFT equations by a quantum Monte Carlo and going to low temperatures was a long time uh, a big bottleneck. So now this is actually uh, becoming quite feasible. So I would say the uh, calculations that I've shown you are uh, in the ballpark that are very nicely in our control nowadays. However, if now you ask for the hard part, I think this is uh, in the perspective that I put down here, but I didn't comment on. So, of course, having shown that we can, in principle, understand microscopic mechanisms of what is happening in these compounds, we also want to go further to understand in more detail now, for example, how one can play on this. So influences of uh, doping, substitutions, deficiencies, train stress. I think there is still a lot of play going, and I'm very much looking to, to Pete, looking forward to Peter's talk now, who will uh, open this game, I think. Um, so I think there is a lot of work still to be done, and which can be done now, because we know we have the handle now and the tools to actually attack more complicated setups in compli more complicated uh, unit cells and where we do not just have the minimal uh, little ideal crystal approximation. So I think uh, essentially what I've shown you here is not something which is nowadays the, um, the most brutal uh, computational challenge, but on the other hand, it opens now the door to go to actually very much more realistic uh, situations where you can assess uh, those uh, control parameters, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that what you were saying about the temperature effects is, is really fascinating because yeah. the interplay between, you know, the electronic structure and what happens with the bonons, I guess, of the system, uh, in principle, is not an easy thing to control. And so the fact that you can do it is... Yeah. Well, okay, I should be uh, more precise now. So what okay. we did here is not the phonons, actually. All right. Because what we did here was really the calculation for the fixed crystal structure. Okay. So what I'm talking here, and what is to some extent even more surprising than saying uh, if you uh, heat up, you, you get phonons and uh, the crystal is, is, is uh, moving. What we are looking at here is actually pure electronic temperature effects. So that, that is actually, the I think, the remarkable thing. Yeah. That is the, the temperature dependence, which usually is uh, either neglected or just taken from a Fermi function. And so this picture shows you that even for a completely fixed crystal structure, the temperature dependence of the spectral properties are far away and far beyond what you would actually encode by just having a Fermi function uh, describing you how to occupy states at a finite temperature. So it's really intrinsically the electronic structure itself changes because the influence of the many body effects on the electronic soup somehow changes. Right, that, that, I, yeah, okay, that's even more intriguing then, yes, absolutely. And do you think that adding ionic vibrations could change this? Um, I, I think adding uh, ionic vibrations will still even more complicate the picture. I don't think this will undo this. I mean, I think it looks clear that uh, if anything, you will make it worse. <laughs> okay, very cool. Um, 
So we seem to have very quiet participants today, oh, but Peter wants to ask a question. So just unmute yourself and go for it. So uh, if I may ask a question, uh, if there is no question from the audience, I'm very happy. You, you go first and then we'll catch up with the audience. Okay. So I actually have a, a perhaps a technical question on the hydrogen dope vanadium dioxide study that you've done. And so I believe that in this work, you also employ the um, intersite potential that uh, is featured yeah. in your works with, uh, with Jan Tomczak before, right? Yes, yes. So I did not comment at all on that technical part, but actually what mm -hmm. we did was indeed to use what we uh, knew from from this work essentially. Mm -hmm. So here we did a very detailed analysis actually um, based on the full calculation in the first place. And then, as I mentioned, extracting an effective potential from the many body self energy. And what you, or, or the reason why you can do this actually is that if you go to the bonding, anti-bonding basis of the A1G orbital here, you find that within the negative frequency range, the bonding self-energy is pretty much a constant. Mm -hmm. And in the positive frequency range, the anti-bonding self-energy is pretty much a constant. And if you take just these two constants as effective orbital dependent potentials, you do the band structure calculation, you get this thing. So this tells us that if we have this dimer physics, we can actually nicely approximate the money body dimer effects by this kind of uh, potential. And so this is what we did, what we used in the um, hydrogen, um, what was it? In the hydrogen uh, doped uh, case. So here we were actually uh, treating the uh, A1G orbital within the scissor approach uh, borrowed from the pure compound and then uh, just uh, uh, analyzed for the remaining EG pi orbitals uh, what is happening. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, and I this think is this a is a nice way actually to, to move uh, forward because of course it makes things uh, much more efficient also in view of if you go now to larger systems. So I guess this is your, uh, your point, right? Yes, in some sense, in some sense. I mean, so, so like my question was aiming at the fact that I understand the validity of the uh, intersite potential approximation in pure VO2 when there is only one electron which only occupies this bonding and debonding state. But then in this hydrogenated picture, you now have additional electrons. So uh, isn't there um, so, so isn't there a, a reason for also including um, the intersite effect of the other orbitals, except for um, this A1G one? Um, well, but those really uh, do point orthogon in orthogonal directions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So physically, it looks pretty safe to okay. uh, assume that they are not really uh, coming in. I mean, of course, one can always uh, use the hammer and, and then show that it comes out to be small. But OK, I think uh, we, we really know that they point away from the dangerous direction. So in that sense, this was not our first priority. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Sarah, I think you're muted. Thank you, Peter. I was saying that there is a question from Alex Tunger, and Alex, you have the mic. Yes. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Hello, Alex. Yeah. Hi, Silke. Thank you so much, as usual, for a very, very clear uh, talk. Um, I wanted to clarify in my mind, if you have a collaboration between two effects, like uh, uh, Coulomb enhanced piles, or pyrals enhanced Coulomb, is there a way to decide um, the contributions of each of them? Is it possible, uh, so for instance, the pyrals effect has to do with dimerization, and dimerization is a measurable effect. You can measure, of course, the bond lengths of the different vanadium-vanadium uh, bonds in the system, uh, and then that would decide the degree of dimerization and the magnitude of the pyrals effect. Is it, uh, you know, our tradition is usually to use total energy to tell us uh, the importance of different effects. Now, if you were to enhance the dimerization effect, 
by having slightly different bond lengths for vanadium-vanadium pairs in the, in the M1 phase, you will have more pyrolysis effect, and maybe you don't need a Coulomb effect. And conversely, if you increase the Coulomb uh, uh, parameter, uh, you know, by 20%, maybe you don't need piles. So have you considered that it's really a matter of figuring out what does the total energy say? Because if um, it gives you a bigger, a, a bigger dimerization, maybe that's uh, enough. So what, what level of dimerization are you using when you are saying Coulomb enhanced piles are using the experimental dimerization degree or, or can you determine it from total energy? Yes, yes. Okay, thanks for the, for the interesting question. Yes. Um, so first let me clarify. I'm, I'm not comparing um, correlation enhanced piles and piles enhanced Coulomb. What, what I'm, um, I, I think what you mean I, I should compare is correlation enhanced uh, piles and uh, Coulomb, right? No, so no, no, the I question mean, I mean, of, uh, okay. of mod insulator. You use your language correlation enhanced pyrols. Yeah. Can you decide uh, whether correlation is needed and how big is the collaboration between those effects? Like 100% versus 0% or 50-50? Uh, that's a well-posed total energy question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so let me, let me, there's actually three answers to your question, I think. Um, so first of all, of course, if you uh, enhance the uh, distortion, it is obvious that, and it has been done, there's a paper, I, I don't have the reference of, on the top of my head, but there is a paper, it has been done. Um, so of course you can uh, just split off the A1G band because if you move the atoms close enough together, you of course enhance the hopping T, that sets you in the pure piles picture, the uh, bonding antibonding splitting, and at some point this is enough. So you can uh, play this game, the, there is no uh, question on this. Um, the second question, uh, doing the energetics, yes, of course. Um, this is not a thing that we have done, but this is essentially what has been done in the Venskovich paper. So the energetics is uh, coming out uh, uh, quite nicely. Um, and that was but actually... She a, but she has no gap. She cannot get no, the no. M1 phase with it. So. No, she, she doesn't have a gap. But uh, uh, still, they were arguing that you have, uh, for example, the energetics of a path uh, transforming one structure in the other and so on. So the energetics is, is, is nice. Um, what I can say from my side, so uh, correlation enhanced uh, piles or uh, Coulomb. Um, so if it was Coulomb, if it was pure, pure Coulomb, that would even be in contradiction to experiment because then you would actually crank up U up to a point that you would localize electrons. And I think you would you need a, a giant U. So we were actually uh, trying it uh, at relatively reasonable values of U and U are you're just far away. You would have to really, really crank up to insane values. You can do that at some point. It will, of course, get insulating. But then you would have a local moment. So you would be in flagrant contradiction to the magnetic susceptibility that was measured. So I've shown you this very, very nice, uh, completely dead flat curve, which is actually showing that you're essentially in this uh, singlet state. So this is why I believe it's, it's really fair to say that uh, there is um, this uh, importance of the correlation effect for enhancing the bonding antibonding splitting in the sense that I have shown it to you. But in the, at, the, at the basis, there is the, the piles distortion, which is uh, actually um, at, the, at the heart of the, the first physical mechanism. And that also kind of explains the puzzle that uh, in this debate of Venskovich and Puget was coming out, because they were kind of opposing uh, as if it was completely two different mechanisms. But uh, now we can understand how you actually move essentially from one to the other. So you can go to the M2 phase and there have a mod insulating chain. And that's not a contradiction because the correlations as a, as a parameter are there in the M1 phase. It's just that they are, uh, because of the dimerization, uh, acting in a slightly different way. So I would put it like, like this. Okay. We have another question from Lucas Rump. Lucas? 
Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, sadly, I wasn't attending the DMFT uh, session. So, um, like, I'm, I'm aware that there are multiple approaches to uh, transition metal and transition metal oxides, um, like LDA plus U, or you have uh, hybrid functionals, local hybrid functionals, and so on. Um, could you maybe in just one or two sentences maybe say how it uh, compare your method compares uh, to those methods, uh, especially also on the computational cost side? Okay, okay, let me actually switch back to my remarks slide here. Um, so yes, there's, there's different methods. Uh, you mentioned LDA plus U, hybrid functionals. Uh, I would add GW because in GW I, I understand a bit more what is actually going on. Um, so LDA plus U, um, that is the remark number three here. Um, and it I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see your slides. Good ah, sorry. sharing the screen anymore. Oh, I see, I see, I see. That is, of course, a little disadvantage. Uh, good. So now you can see it again. Yes? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so LDA plus U is actually not uh, really getting it unless you do something insane to U. And that is actually for the same reason as we just said, uh, even in single site DMFT, you will need you would need to crank up U to insane values, and then you would not get the physics because you would not have the singlet uh, state. Um, so that is, uh, I think, uh, somehow not incorporating the physics that you need, which is really this uh, correlated dimer physics. However, um, the hybrid functional does something uh, relatively similar, I think, to what either GW is doing or what also the effective potential that we constructed here in this uh, 2008 paper or 2007 journal of physics on this matter, I think, um, where we were constructing a static potential, which is essentially reproducing the spectral function. So that tells you that, okay, you can find an orbital dependent that means non-local uh, effective potential to actually get the band structure. Um, you will not get the, the lifetimes, you may not get the, the temperature dependence uh, of the more complicated phases, but you will get essentially a very nice uh, picture of where the states are lying in the M1 phase. Okay, having said this, of course, there's a question how to get this potential. So we did back engineer it uh, after having done the DMFT or cluster DMFT calculation. And on that basis, we compared. But of course, you can ask now, for example, in a GW fashion, what do I get? And um, so the, the short answer, so it has been investigated in quite detail. There's very nice work by uh, Gatti et al, Sakuma et al, uh, even Jan Tomczak in his PhD thesis already uh, worked on this. Um, the question of what GW is doing in VO2 is uh, relatively closely related to what is actually uh, doing for a Hubbard dimer. And I do have a slide on this, I believe. Let me just uh, switch here. Uh, yes, okay. So you just take a Hubbard dimer as a function of U, and this is now the spectral function, it's a function of energy. And it evolves from uh, bonding, anti-bonding, uh, non-interacting, hund mulliken whatever you, want, you would like to call it, molecular level system here to a system where you have four peaks. So here you have some faint, but still uh, there, satellites, and the bonding, anti-bonding splitting is enhanced by U, so this is this uh, square root of U squared plus T squared behavior, uh, where the U enhances just the uh, splitting that you observe. So now this is the exact solution of the dimer. And you can ask what GW is doing for that. So this is now a plot where we don't have the intensity anymore, but we have the location of the peaks. So the red curve is the exact. So again, bonding, anti-bonding here and here. And the green curve is what GW does. And what you see is that indeed, it gets correctly the fact that you have these four peaks. Um, 
it is having the bonding antibonding splitting essentially set at the non-interacting value. So there's a very, very slight uh, dependence on, the, on, on U, which means that at large use, it is underestimating the bonding antibonding splitting. Um, but it also, and that is probably more serious, relatively strongly overestimates the energy of the satellite. So apart from these details, the, the overall uh, well, bonding, anti-bonding uh, description uh, is there, and now it's a question of, uh, it's a quantitative question, if it's enough to uh, open up the, the gap in VO2. And uh, that uh, is indeed, I would say, what has been observed in the different works, namely that uh, things depend quite strongly how exactly you do the GW calculation. Do you do it self-consistently on, based on which orbitals and so on? What is your starting point? Um, and uh, so I think uh, the overall uh, answer, does it open up the gap? Is, is, uh, it can. Um, with the caveats that uh, you can deduce from this plot here. And the same then I think is true for, for hybrid functionals because uh, I, on this relatively, uh, let's say global level, I, I view the hybrid functional as yet another way of constructing a static approximation uh, to the self energy. Okay, I thank you. Did, I don't know if this did answer your question or. Uh, yeah, thank you. And Lucas, you can find the lecture on dynamic and midfield theory on the CCAM YouTube channel if you are curious to go deeper into some of these aspects. Okay, so thank you very much, Silke. I think that we are now ready to move to the second talk of this session by Peter Milkvik from ETH Zurich, who, as anticipated, will uh, take us through what happens when, when you use germanium substitutions to the various different computing phases in uh, VO2. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, I hope you can hear me and see my screen. Yes, everything is fine. And the slides changing as well. Perfect. Perfect. OK. okay. So uh, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. And also thank you very much for organizing such a nice workshop uh, with a very nice speaker. And I will continue the trend that has already been started now. Um, and we'll talk about vanadium dioxide again. But now in terms of uh, research that I've done here at ETH with my supervisors, Professor Claude Eder and Professor Nicholas Bolgen on the influence of germanium substitution on the structural and electronic stability of competing vanadium dioxide phases. And so indeed we are interested in vanadium dioxide for the same reasons that Silke has already outlined very nicely. Uh, and that is the metal insulated transition occurring in the material. So in particular, in a, a vanadium dioxide tin film, uh, we, saw, we see that very small external changes, such as small changes in temperature, can lead to large property effects. For example, a large change in resistance uh, of a sample. And this is due to the metal insulated transition. And indeed, of course, this is very interesting from a, um, from a physical understanding standpoint, but it is, also, it is also very interesting for a wide range of potential applications, ranging from very mundane ones, such as smart windows, through electrical applications in emristors and transistors, to more futuristic applications in neuromorphic computing, etc. And indeed, vanadium dioxide is a prototypical material that undergoes a metal insulated transition. It goes from a metallic rutal phase, uh, denoted with R, uh, and at the critical temperature of around 340 Kelvin, which is very close to the room temperature, it changes into a monoclinic insulating phase labeled M1. The main structural difference between these two phases is the fact that there is a dimerization occurring along the C direction, as was very nicely outlined before, where in the rutile phase, we have equidistant chains of vanadiums that are all in one line with the same distance in between. Whereas in the monoclinic phase, we now observe a structural dimerization with vanadiums getting closer together and tilting off axis. And this effect is not only structural, but also carries over to the, uh, to the electronic structure and, and poses a lot of interesting questions that have been a point of discussion for the last decades. 
Uh, and indeed a very, very, let's say heated debate, uh, which as uh, Silke already, taught, already said, uh, seems to be concluded now, is the question of the interplay of perils and mod effects in this monoclinic phase and the strength of each uh, effect here. However, the research I would like to talk about today does not uh, pose to answer this question, but indeed tries to focus on another one, uh, um, another one affecting the metal and solid transition, and it is the point of tunability of the metal and solid transition in VO2. And indeed, the VO2 is interesting both because of simplicity, but also because of the fact that its metal and solid transition can be tuned very easily. And there is a wide range of uh, experimental papers. Here I just selected a few, uh, which look at various, uh, various conditions. Uh, very often these are uh, various dopants that are added into VO2 in order to change um, this hysteresis loop of the MIT that I talked about before. And indeed, these try to either change the transition temperature or widen the hysteresis loop or narrow or narrow down the hysteresis loop, change the different heights of the resistivities, et cetera. And quite recently, um, an experimental group at EPFL, which is one of our collaborators, uh, has found that under germanium doping, there is a marked increase in transition temperature in vanadium dioxide. And this came as quite a surprise because because very often it has been thought that uh, only charged dopants are able to change the transition temperature in vanadium dioxide significantly. And indeed, germanium doping uh, is not charged, where germanium has the same oxidation state, four plus as vanadium and vanadium dioxide. So it came as a bit of a surprise that germanium doped VO2 thin films have a really high transition temperature in, in around 10 degrees higher than pure VO2. And so, uh, so we we try to we, or in this research we try to answer the question of how this happens or when we can shine light on this um, and explain what is going on. And so in particular, I would like to uh, just spend one slide on the methods that we use because these are uh, quite different from uh, what was just talked about. Because indeed, uh, in, in the work that I will present now, uh, we only use conventional DFT. Um, we stay at the PDE level. And uh, we describe our system without any edit plus U or any edit corrections. And this is because uh, we see that the structural properties of vanadium dioxide are almost, uh, almost exact to the experiment. So they're very good without addition of any correlations. And we also see that uh, with only treating the system using DFT, we believe that we can capture well the effects uh, that the addition of a different chemical dopant uh, has on the system, uh, we believe we can capture this well enough with, um, with conventional DFT. Uh, with that said, however, uh, of course, this is just the first step uh, onto a more involved treatment that uh, we hope um, to pursue further on late, a bit later. Uh, and indeed, these calculations would be a starting point for more correlated treatment. So addition of, for example, dynamical mean field theory into the picture with uh, a whole host of questions of how to exactly do that. Um, being still in front of me. And indeed, this is a topic of uh, basically another talk. And so uh, indeed, the way we model a system uh, with, we model an adium dioxide system with germanium uh, substitution is via the way of supercells. And so what we first do as a, as a first stepping stone is we construct a relatively small supercell with two by two by two, um, of, of the size of two by two by two monoclinic lattice. Here we have a view along uh, the A direction. So vanadium chains go along C as always. And after this qualitative look, after, uh, after observing uh, some interesting things, we then, we then go into a larger supercell, which extends in the C direction. And we try to have a more detailed study with um, multiple germaniums in the cell, so having different relative configurations of the germanium within the cell, with also various doping configurations, and trying to draw some quantitative conclusions as well. So first things first, if we look at the smaller cell, uh, we first want to note that the electronic structure, which I show here through the band structure, seems to remain unaffected. And so in here, in particular, what you see is in the, in the white line, we have the pristine band structure, which this is a detail of the one on the left, um, and in the colored line, we see the unfolded supercell band structure. And then on the very left, we see germanium density of states. 
The first thing to note is that there is very little or no germanium states near the Fermi level. So the Fermi level resides around here. And as you can see, the, the weight of the one germanium or two, or two germaniums that we have largely, largely sits way below the Fermi level with very little hybridization with vanadiums and most hybridization with oxygens. The second thing to note is that we that in this monoclinic phase, which is what I'm showing here, uh, we don't see uh, that, that much of a change in the occupation of vanadium bands. So indeed, you can see that the, the band structure, the, the colored background, corresponds quite well uh, with the white lines drawn. And we pursue this further uh, into looking at the chemical bonding uh, that occurs between this added germanium and the vanadiums around it. And in particular, what we look at is something called COHO, which is the crystal orbital Hamiltonian population. And uh, in my view, it can be looked at as a directional density of states. And in some sense, and, and so if it is positive, it tells us that there is a bonding feature, whereas if it's negative, it tells us that there is an anti-bonding feature. And so in particular, if we uh, first look at the monoclinic vanadium vanadium bond, which is this blue line, we see that there is a strong bonding feature below the Fermi level and a strong anti-bonding feature around two electron volts above the Fermi level. This agrees very well with uh, what is known about BO2, about having a singlet state, you know, which is strongly bonding. However, what we also notice in the green lines is that germanium vanadium bonding, with the full line being the nearest neighbor and the dashed line being the next nearest neighbor, is comparatively very weak. Especially around the Fermi level, we see almost no uh, bonding behavior between germaniums and vanadiums, uh, with only some, some interaction occurring in this oxygen range down here and this oxygen range up here. And these features are much weaker even than the root phase, which we know does not host uh, a dimer, so it does not host the bond. So with these things in mind, uh, we can think about the germanium doping as some sort of uh, just added structural effect into our system. So we have our vanadium system, we add the germanium, and we have some structural uh, disorder created. And indeed, we observe already uh, in this smaller cell a qualitative structural change. Structural change. Uh, in the monoclinic phase, which is the dimerized one, we don't really see much. We only see immediate neighbors being affected. But in the root cell phase, we see large structural reorganization. So in fact, so here I'm looking, I'm showing you two details of uh, the resultant geometry optimized structure where yellow dot is the germanium. And once we add the germanium, now, if you remember the vanadium chains are going along the C direction. So this way, we observe that there is a formation of dimers here indicated by these bonds and also formation of structural trimers, which are due to the periodicity of the cell being too small. And indeed, this is one of the reasons why we moved on to a larger cell. But the qualitative conclusions from this can be drawn because also if we look along the chain, so now this is looking down along the vanadiums, uh, which were previously in this Wutal phase very nicely ordered in a, uh, in a spatially uh, regular fashion. Now we see in these uh, dashed ellipses that we get some sort of a caterpillar-like pattern uh, with, these, with these vanadiums being tilted off axis. And if you remember back to the first few slides and to Silke's talk, the difference between the rutal and the monoclinic structures is indeed that in the monoclinic structure, we have dimers forming and we have tilted, uh, tilted vanadiums existing. And so in some sense, we, we qualitatively observe some change from the rutal in the direction of the monoclinic. But we of course want to make this more quantitative. So that's why we move on to our larger cell, where first I want to show you the energetics of if we put the germanium atoms in certain positions, which, which configurations are really the lowest energy, uh, which are the ones that we really should be interested in. And this I, would, I, I, I tried to show with uh, this color map here, where the monoclinic phase is on the left and the rutal phase is on the right. Um, and with the black hexagon, I denote a germanium atom, which we, remain, which we uh, retain in the same position always. And then we add the other germanium atom somewhere else in, in the cell, and then color the dot corresponding to the, uh, the energy of that configuration. And then here we select a, uh, a representative set of samples, uh, which we, we didn't really cover the whole cell, but, but this is a very representative sample of all the possible directions that we can take. And so there are a few conclusions to, to see here, where first, one can note that germanium atoms prefer clustering. And so indeed, uh, specifically, if you look at in the monoclinic phase, 
we see that if there is a germanium atom at this body axis composition and another germanium atom either below, below it in the chain, so occupying the other dimer position, or in the neighboring chain, these uh, configurations are quite low in energy. With the same being true in the rutile phase, where in the rutile phase we see this behavior happen in the, uh, in the neighboring chains. So if this uh, position is occupied by a germanium and this position is occupied by germanium, we have a low energy configuration. Uh, the next thing to note is that germanium atoms, uh, as they uh, as they organize in the cell, uh, they want to keep the dimerization seemingly intact. Indeed, one can see this in the monoclonic phase, where the energy of occupying the other dimer site, so filling the whole dimer with two germaniums, is markedly lower than filling then starting to fill another dimer with a germanium. So like breaking two dimers costs way more energy than breaking just one and occupying the other cell with germanium. But one can also see it in the rutile phase where indeed the energy of leaving two vanadiums between two germaniums is much lower. So if the configuration is such that there is a germanium here and germanium here, it leaves two vanadiums to nicely dimerize in between and the system uh, is energetically more favorable. Then, for example, that having a germanium atom here and a germanium atom here with only a single vanadium in between. Indeed, this is the highest energy configuration because it only leaves us with one uh, single vanadium with a single electron in between, which uh, seemingly does not know what to do and hence pushes the energy of this configuration way up. Way up. And the last a rather surprising thing to know is that these effects seem to be quite larger in the rutile phase than they are in the monoclinic. In the monoclinic, we indeed see the colors to be kind of washed out. Uh, you can you can sparsely make uh, make out some structure here, but in the rutile phase, it is really clear which energies are uh, are are the lowest. And so now I want to look at particular configurations uh, in more detail. And as a measure, I would like to use uh, some sort of bond distances or nearest neighbor vanadium vanadium distances, where I select three specific configurations, so GE01, GE02, GE03, which are along the chain. Um, and then what I'm showing in dark blue and dark red are the pristine are the pristine crystal phases. So you see that the monoclinic phase has a fully dimerized structure where we have short bonds and long bonds, and the rutile phase only has one length of a bond because it's an equidistant chain. So after the addition of germanium, we now see the following. We see that the monoclinic phase uh, still retains this dimerization pattern, but becomes distorted. You know, we have a, we have a Gaussian distortion along the, uh, around these peaks, uh, which still remain, however, the most likely bond distance to occur. However, in the rutile phase, the story is quite different. In the rutile phase, after the addition of germanium, we now have this light red, we, have, we now have this light red color, where we see that uh, the germanium, that the vanadium vanadium distances become completely disordered. Um, there is, in all the different configurations, we see that there is a wide variety of different bond lines that one obtains after geometry optimization. Indeed, in the G02 configuration, we see uh, formation of two peaks, and in G03, we see a whole spectrum of different bond lines reaching down to the shortest possible bond lengths that we saw in the M1 phase to the longest possible bond lengths in the M1 phase. And the story is the same if you look at the bond angles. So these are the angles that the that these nearest neighbor vanadium vanadium distances make. So in some sense, this is a quantitative measure of the, the caterpillar-like shape I was showing before, uh, where indeed, again, we see that the monoclinic phase, although it, the picture is less clear in these angles than in the distances, we again see that the monoclinic phase retains some sort of finite angle, which seems to have some distribution around a finite value uh, in all of these configurations. But the rutile phase gets shifted away from the zero uh, from the zero degree uh, rotation that it had into some sort of uh, distribution, which is against the strongest the GE03 configuration, which leaves two vanadiums between uh, two dimerize. And so we have a nice distribution. And of course, this these structural effects uh, carry over into the electronic effects, where uh, in the electronic structure, we are now looking at a particular configuration at the G03 configuration, which was low in energy. And we are particularly considering the projected density of states on the A1G orbital, which is the orbital along the chain. Uh, it is the orbital which is occupied the most in the monoclinic phase. And it is the one which tells you whether you have a dimerized 
um, dimer, dimer, electronically dimerized structure into a bonding and antibonding pair. And so previously, uh, we had these thick lines, which is uh, in blue, again, pristine monoclinic phase, and in red, pristine rutile phase. And after the addition of germanium, uh, we see the same behavior we saw through the structure. So we see that the nearest neighbor, which is the full line, retains its, uh, its dimerized peaks. So there is a bonding peak and an antibonding peak. Uh, this remains very nice. And the same is true for the average, which is shown in the dashed line. Uh, so the average of all the atoms in the whole unit cell uh, stays almost exactly the same as it was before. However, in the rutile phase here, we see uh, quite a striking change. So we move away from the previous very fully metallic um, phase that uh, hosted, the, that had a large amount uh, of density of states at the fermion level into uh, something which for the nearest neighbor looks completely identical to the, to the monoclinic phase. So we have a completely bonding and debonding peak. So indeed we are, we believe we are forming a dimer. And also the whole structure as an, as an average uh, becomes quite distorted from what it was before. Uh, with a severe depletion of states at the Fermi level, we see that this, this root alpha phase seems to be being pushed towards the monoclinic one. Uh, and indeed, this brings me to uh, the summary and the conclusions that we make of this. And so at first, the first thing to note is that we see that under germanium doping, uh, the root alpha phase is much more perturbed than the monoclinic phase for all the different configurations that we probe. Uh, we also see that these perturbations that we observe seem to take this rutile phase and bring it closer to the monoclinic one, both from the structural standpoint and, and then leading on from it, also from the electronic standpoint. Uh, we observe that this rutile phase starts to form structural dimers, which then lead to electronic dimers. And then lastly, uh, this leads us to uh, make, a, make a connection to what the experimentalists have found, and that is that um, it, it does seem that the monoclonic phase seems to be more, uh, more stable or less perturbed under germanium doping than the rutile phase, uh, which could possibly, which, which hints at an agreement with this increased transition temperature. Since it is the low temperature phase that, uh, that could outlast the high, the, the, the high temperature phase uh, for longer time. Uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Peter, for a very, very nice talk. Um, Maybe while we wait for participants or for Silke to, to ask a question, I can ask um, something. I mean, you showed the effects on the energetics of substituting uh, the germanium in, in various sites. And you mentioned that, yes, exactly. There is a tendency to preserve a dimer uh, structure. But then if I look at the R phase, mm -hmm. I see high up there a cluster of positions that seem to um, somehow contradict that statement. Why? So indeed, in this, I, I assume you mean these uh, exactly this cluster here, and so I I would think that so for example this configuration here, which uh, we in, in our labeling system we label it G zero three, so this in fact uh, um, seems to want to keep the dimerization actually because if we have a germanium atom here and another germanium atom here, this leaves two vanadiums in between which then dimerize and then uh, allow for the formation of this M1 phase. And of course, th this picture becomes, I mean, th the way I'm describing it here um, is very simplistic, right? But um, I think it holds quite well for if we, leave, if we remain in the same chain, but then of course, if we keep one germanium in, the, in one chain and add another germanium in a separate chain, uh, th these arguments become a bit a bit more muddy, so that's why I didn't didn't really want to go there either because it, it it's I mean the, the the whole structure is quite disordered, so it's not really clear to say that if we add a germanium here and another germanium here, how exactly do dimers form or does this contribute to dimerization or does it not? So okay, thank you. Do we have other questions? Silke, do you have a question? Yes, yes, thank you. Actually, I was not able to write it in the Q&A, but uh, of course I do. Um, so thank you very much, Peter, for this very, very clear talk and very nice work. So this illustrates exactly this direction of uh, now we 
have a handle on uh, understanding materials properties microscopically and we can push towards uh, controlling the properties so these changes in uh, tc by doing something to the material is i think a very exciting uh, field uh, and even more if you can understand something from a micro microscopic point of view so thanks a lot for the uh, very interesting and very clear talk um, there is a point uh, where i would like to check that I understand things correctly. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you said that the uh, drastic temperature change goes in the direction of a large enhancement, right? Uh, of, wait, wait, so what, what do you mean by a large enhancement? So, so you, you increase the transition temperature when you do the germanium doping. Yes, indeed, yes. yes, yes. Um, so that means uh, either you have to stabilize the monoclinic phase mm -hmm. with respect to the rutel phase, or you have to do something else, but which is also insulating, right? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, and so you seem to be arguing that the, um, gem, that the germanium doping perturbs the rutile phase in the sense of, in the direction of the M1. Mm -hmm. So this is the part that I did not completely follow because from your plot, I was rather getting the impression, and you said it, that uh, the rutile phase gets more disordered. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering why you actually interpret this as being closer to M1, mm -hmm. rather than saying uh, maybe it's uh, so much disorder disturbed rutile phase that it is also insulating, but not because of the typical mechanism of the M1. Mm -hmm. the, that's of course a very good point. Thank you very much for, uh, for such a question. So, so first, before I answer, I would like to note that um, it is rather difficult to draw conclusions between the relative stabilities or relative effects on these two phases, on the rutile and monoclinic phases, because in uh, in so using conventional DFT, uh, as you probably know, the energetic differences between the monoclinic and rutile phases are incorrect. So indeed, uh, normal DFT predicts that the rutile phase is lower in energy than the monoclinic phase, uh, which makes direct comparisons between any energies of one phase to the energies of the other phase uh, rather problematic. And this is also the reason why going forward, we would like to use more involved methods to uh, have a tool to directly compare these two, um, these two phases. And then uh, getting into uh, answering the question. So, Yes, of course. I mean, we do not really, we are not really able to say uh, with certainty that it is not just the disorder of the rutile phase that makes it insulating um, in some new, well, let's say, more exotic way. Um, but from, from the way we see the structure changing, so in particular, the way, so, so of course, I mean, from these, from these plots that I've shown here, we only see that the distances get uh, get a bit disordered. We also see that the the angles get a bit more disordered. But I think that from the from from if you look at the electronics, the the, the density of states as I'm showing here, uh, I think we can really see that that some of the vanadiums near the germanium. So if we really have germaniums that push vanadiums next to each other, we do see um, some sort of uh, singlet forming, let's say, or a, a strong anti bonding anti bonding feature which is in very nice agreement with the monoclinic phase. But we do not see this in the whole, in the whole, um, we do not see this in the whole supercell or the sample, let's say. Uh, we only see this at, at very specific points. But I think that if we had a, uh, if we had a method which would capture both the root and monoclinic phase at the same time, we would be able to perhaps take this root phase into the monoclinic one like push it out of the, the rutalness into the monoclinic phase. Is, does that, is that, does that yeah. at least try to answer what you asked? Yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's very interesting. I mean, I will check your paper out more in detail. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Yes, indeed, actually, uh, so I think, I think uh, this link to the paper is not on the CCAM website because uh, this got, I mean, it finally got published uh, yesterday or two days ago, so. Congratulations, then I will find it. <laughs> thank you. So if you send it to us, we will update the, uh, the abstract if you want, no problem. Okay.
So if there are no more questions from our online participants, then I think I should move to thanking very, very, very much both our speakers for helping us to kick off this new season of the Mixed Gen series in such a nice and uh, an interesting way. So thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Silke, for being with us today. And I would like also to thank all of you uh, who have been uh, listening to this talk and, and asking questions to make them much more interesting and lively. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for organizing. Mm -hmm.